It looks perfect. Thank you. Okay, so so th thank you very much, Mati. Those were really kind words. And good afternoon to everyone. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk on a topic that I think um, I'm very passionate about and something that I think um, needs to go out to, to all people that are looking after children. And I've entitled this talk, LRTI, when I, uh, further investigations warranted. So, so most of you have seen um, this publication and this was the recent guideline that was published on the diagnosis of management of community acquired pneumonia in children. And I urge you to read this guideline as a preamble to the talk that I'm giving you. Um, I think most of you probably would have gone through this at some point. If you haven't had the opportunity to read this article, I would recommend that you go to pediatrics.org.za and that's the SAPA website. Look for the resources tab um, as indicated by the arrow and you'll find this resource as well as a whole host of other resources available to you. Um, the, the, the the com community looking after children in South Africa. So this document um, that was published in 2020 um, had essentially a very short section on the management of a child who is not responding to therapy. And that got me uh, thinking and I approached the uh, senior author on that paper, Professor Heather Zai, and I said to her, look, I think there may be a need for a, a longer paper on this topic, looking at children who have had lower respiratory tract infections and deciding when to investigate further. And after consulting with her and then collaborating with, with a few other uh, pulmonologists as well as um, Professor Ann Cheng from Queensland uh, in Australia, who is really one of the leading researchers in bronchiectasis and has published quite widely, we decided to write this paper, which we public, published in Punches of Pediatrics last year. So if you do have a chance, please do read this article. But what I thought I'd do in this talk is simplify some of the thoughts that we had when putting together this paper and also providing a few cases so that you can um, get an understanding of why it's so important. So the, the, the real aim of this paper was to provide this pragmatic approach, the when and the how for further investigations. And then obviously, deciding how this differs from a child who has a inverted commas normal amount of infections or symptoms. So who is the target audience? Essentially, it's anybody who looks after children. So on the left hand side, it's the pediatrician or the uh, general practitioner that's looking after children with lung problems, the fatigue registrar in the middle who's also looking after children with, with lung problems, or any outpatient district setting where there's medical officers looking after children with lung problems. And why is this topic important? Well, essentially we don't want children to have chronic symptoms. I mean, that goes without saying, but more importantly, we want to prevent respiratory sequelae and impairment in lung health. And whether that sequelae be obstructive or restrictive lung disease, um, going right on to bronchiectasis, pulmonary hypertension, or just narrowing of the airways um, from whatever cause, we really want to prevent that. Because once this has happened, I think unfortunately we've missed the, off we've missed the boat. Now the good news, and it goes without saying, is that most children will recover after a lower respiratory tract infection. And I think the important thing um, is now deciding who you're going to investigate further. And there's very little high level evidence to support the timing and the extent of investigations required, more so in settings where HIV and TB are endemic, such as ours in South Africa. So what we've, decided to do in this, in this approach is to first tell the clinician to look for the red flags. And the red flag, one could use the SPUR acronym, um, and I'm going to take you through the SPUR acronym, essentially to, to bring out those red flags to make you or alert the clinician to the possibility of an underlying problem. And what the SPUR stands for, essentially the S stands for severe. So someone who's had a severe hospitalization or prolonged hospitalization, multi-system involvement, the need for ventilation. The P stands for persistence. So either, either that's persistent of clinical uh, symptoms, respiratory symptoms like cough or wheeze, or the persistence of radiological features or failure of resolution. The, the U stands for unusual, and I'll go through that in the next slide. And R stands for recurrent. So this per acronym, and I'm sure most have heard 
this acronym in the context of primary immunodeficiency, but also to think about it in this context is that if you have the presence of spur, you should think of an underlying problem. So the U is really where I like to think of the four Cs. So I'm just trying to use uh, mental representations to help uh, remember some of these. And the four Cs are clinical presentations, whether that be clinical, um, the chronic symptoms of upper or lower respiratory tract, the poor growth or failure to thrive, feeding difficulties, chest wall abnormalities, clubbing, um, pulmonary hypertension, the presence of comorbidities and, and essentially HIV and malnutrition are big ones in South Africa, but, ev but even congenital heart disease is important. And then the unusual chest X-ray findings and we'll hear a lot more about chest X-rays in the next talk. And finally, the unusual colonies, which is that is the microbiological findings having organisms that should not be found on um, or found in the lung. So that's, that's really the SPUR acronym and that's really the alert, that's the red flag for a clinician. And just to touch on lower respiratory symptoms, the cough and the wheeze, once you're alerted to the possibility of um, an underlying problem, you'll obviously take a further history and examination. And these lower respiratory symptoms in the history may provide you with clues as to what pattern may be emerging. For example, and this is just a diagrammatic representation of this. So I'll, I'll use the timeline of four weeks as the cutoff. So if someone's having respiratory symptoms for more than four weeks, generally that's when we get a bit more concerned. And you could have respiratory symptoms that are normal. You could have a short period of respiratory symptoms or lower respiratory tract symptoms and that goes away and gets back. So the gray bars indicating duration of time, but it gets, when you start seeing a lot more gray bars appearing in a, in a calendar year, then you obviously get more concerned and the way these gray bars present themselves, either as staggered presentations or uh, a, a prolonged presentation or a short presentation with recovery and then a prolonged presentation may give you an indication of what the underlying problem is. And I've just highlighted some of these uh, examples in the boxes on the right. So once you find the spur, this is really that pragmatic approach. Once you find the spur, what do you do next? And thus we really struggled with. We really took some time thinking about how to give guidance to a clinician in South Africa where we have TB and HIV. And I think it goes without saying that you need to exclude HIV and TB before you can even go further. So if there is the presence of spur, think of HIV and TB. And if you look at the arrows going towards the, the, the right of the screen, the consideration of asthma and protracted bacterial bronchitis in a child with a chronic cough is necessary. And in certain settings, for example, in Australia, they found that 40% of ch all children who present with chronic cough do have protracted bacterial bronchitis. Um, and that essentially can be treated with antibiotics. The problem is uh, not treating protracted bacterial bronchitis can, can lead or down a cascade of, of chronic lung inflammation and then the sequelae. If I follow the arrows going downwards, essentially we then go to the X-ray features. So obviously by this point in time, one would then look to an X-ray and if the X-ray is abnormal or if the persistence of symptoms um, in, the, in the presence of a normal X-ray would lead down the pathway of what we would suggest the checklist. Now, the reason we've, we've, we've went with a checklist rather than an algorithm is because there's a lot of things to think about. And for those of you that have read the paper will realize that this checklist actually looks quite um, daunting. Now, there may be reasons also to do a follow-up chest X-ray and these have been highlighted, but the more important thing is to understand that the underlying mechanism is likely to be some sort of bronchial obstruction and therefore a follow-up X-ray may be required. So the checklist, um, I'm going to show you in a second, but before I show you the checklist, I just want to mention that the European Respiratory Society has published this guidance for uh, patients or children with suspected of, or confirmed bronchiectasis. And this is the test they're recommending that you do at least at the very basics to the FPC, the immunoglobulin, sweat test, CT, lung function, sampling the lower airway and looking for TB and HIV. And then further testing based on the, the, the clinical presentation may require immunodeficiency workup or bronchoscopy, identification of cellulitis kinesia, reflux disease, and aspiration. So this is a good guide if people want to use a very simplistic approach, and this is a good starting point. The more daunting uh, checklist looks like this, and I don't expect you to read the slide, nor do I expect you to memorize it. And that's the whole point of a checklist. 
is that you can print out this checklist and systematically go through it uh, depending on the clinical presentation of the child. But this daunting list essentially is just two components. And the two components of this list is to say, think of pathology outside the lung compared to pathology within the lung. Are there problems outside the lung that can predispose the lung to, 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 to developing sequelae? And the three main organ systems that you have to think about is problems in the cardiovascular system. And that's essentially congenital heart disease with increased pulmonary blood flow. From the GIT point of view, thinking of anything that causes aspiration into the lung. And from a CNS or neuromuscular point of view, thinking of anything that affects the cough reflex, weakness of the respiratory muscles, and obviously anything that causes dysphagia or incoordination or swallowing um, from, a, from a neurological point of view. And then from within the airway or within the, the lung point of view, a nice diagrammatic representation would be this one. And think of the escalator on the box A, this is an escalator that's working fine. And essentially what we're trying to mimic here is the cilia, which are brushing away whatever needs to be brushed away in an upward direction. And the image on labeled B, obviously the, the brushing of the dirt cannot happen because there is a foreign body stuck in the way. And in image C, the brushing cannot happen because the escalator is out of order. And that would, an example of that would be a ciliary dyskinesia. So let me now just take away the laborious part of the talk and, 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 and give you a few casing examples. And the first example that I, I like to give is this one here, it's patient Tom. And Tom is a 11 year old child who's quite a good footballer and essentially, Tom um, was playing football one day at school and while playing football, he had a cap of a pen, one of those big pens in his mouth while playing football. And one of his friends knocked him over and the cap disappeared. And what Tom did is he went home and he complained to his mom and said, look, I had this cap in my mouth, it disappeared. And the mom says, you're being very, very naughty. Make sure that you uh, check your poo to see if the cap came out. And that would be normal good advice because most times you'd swallow the cap. <clears throat> but what happened with Tom, unfortunately, is that Tom started coughing and the mother then eventually did seek help from a, a doctor at the hospital. And the doctor did do a chest X-ray looking for whether the foreign body had made any, uh, caused any problems. And after looking at this X-ray, the doctor said, no, there's no problems. The mom can go home. But what he failed to see is a few things. The first thing he failed to see is that the left main bronchus suddenly cuts off. The second thing you fail to see is that there's some sort of lower lobe opacification that's present. And certainly what happened with Tom is for the rest of the year 2020, Tom continued to cough. He lost his appetite. He started losing weight and his breath became really, really bad. But mostly for Tom, the biggest problem was he couldn't play soccer anymore. And the reason he couldn't play soccer is because he just got tired and he would cough. So eventually the family said, no, no, we need to find more help. And this is now a staggering 14 to 16 months later, they go and they see a pediatrician and the pediatrician does another X-ray and this is what the pediatrician finds. And the pediatrician then sends Tom across to, to the pulmonologist and the pulmonologist do a bronchoscopy. And as you can see, there's something lodged into the airway. So we then call the plumbers and the plumbers came and they did a rigid scope and they pulled out a full cap. Oh my God, I couldn't believe it. The full cap came out in an in a 11 year old boy. And then I went and read about this and it seems um, caps are not an uncommon thing to swallow. So at his clinic visit a month later, Tom was still coughing, but his appetite had come back and his weight started increasing. And he had some resolution of his chest X-ray, but you can see it's not completely normal. Um, and he's probably going to stay with this sequelae lifelong. So like I said, chewing caps is not something uncommon. And that is why some of the companies have actually put holes in their caps so that people don't choke. But unfortunately for Tom, this went down his left main bronchus and caused the sequelae that we mentioned. A second case, um, and I'm going to go much quicker through the next two cases just to highlight these points. The second case was a patient DL presented at the age of four years. In 2017, he got admitted for a low respiratory infection in a private clinic. In 2018, he got admitted for a low respiratory infection three times. 
One is a state hospital. The second one is where a bronchoscopy was done and an immunodeficiency workup was done. And the third time was again in a private hospital. In 2019, he had grommets and then he was diagnosed with TB of the spine. And in 2021, he had another, another lower respiratory infection. Now you'd say, oh my God, can, did, did people just miss it? Are people blind? This is so obvious. So by the time he came to us, he was severely wasted and stunted and he had already developed bronchiectasis in a number of areas of his lung. And sadly enough, he only received, and he was diagnosed then with an immunodeficiency, a common variable immunodeficiency. And sadly enough, he only received his intervention in the form of polygam in November, 2021. So that's from 2017, five years later, he actually gets his intervention. The last case is patient LY. She was three years of age. And she was treated on for TB because of having recurrent chest infection. So she was hospitalized twice, started on TB treatment. A year later, she was hospitalized again and given TB treatment again. So she had two courses of TB treatment simply because she had recurrent chest infections, recurrent respiratory symptoms. And both times the TB was not confirmed. Now, this highlights an important point. In South Africa, where TB is so common, if we're not confirming TB, and, and, and unfortunately it is difficult to confirm TB in a young child, but if we're not confirming TB and we're starting TB treatment in, in a case where it's unconfirmed, then the persistence of respiratory symptoms or radiological features should then tell the clinician that there is a problem. And the one problem could be that we're dealing with drug resistant TB or non-adherence. But more importantly, as indicated in this child, is it an alternative diagnosis? And in her case, she actually has a primary ciliary dyskinesia. And what you're seeing here are cross sections of electron microscopy showing the cilia that are missing structural components, making them ineffective. So in conclusion, the important and take home message today from this talk is that if you do not think about it, you're going to miss it. And I'm not saying we need to over investigate every child with respiratory tract infections. Therefore, we need to use the firstly, the red flags. And the first red flag is the spur. So if you have a patient who has features of spur, severe, persistent, unusual, or recurrence, then you should go on to this pragmatic approach, which takes you finally down the uh, checklist. And, the, and essentially, further investigation and close monitoring would then be required, um, depending on what you find. And the early recognition of an underlying disease can prevent disease progression improve quality of life, optimize lung growth, importantly prevent further lung injury and minimize the complications that may occur. So if you haven't read this, this is the paper that um, we wrote and I hope it's an easy read for most people and you can print the table that's in the paper which you can use as the checklist. I thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.